it gives more credibility to our vitamin D hypothesis. It's one way to check um, how it is going to happen. And I think in, in, in Brazil, anyways, it's getting uh, higher and higher now, probably because of the low UV index. In India, we would have to watch out uh, June, July, August. Yeah, it's a great point. And it's very sad. I mean, these are hypotheses. But again, I just stress that they have a long history of research and logic. They're not just jumping on a correlation or anything like it. Welcome to the Fat Emperor podcast. I'm your host, Ivor Cummins. Hey guys, we have a podcast today. Again, it touches on coronavirus, but also vitamin D and particularly UV flux around the world, which is a very uh, common conversation these days. So I'm with uh, Rahul KM today, who's a PhD and has a research team, and they're currently focusing and have a preprint paper out on UV versus vitamin D status uh, versus coronavirus impacts. So great to meet you, Rahul, in person. Thank you very much, Ivor. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, we've had some chats on Twitter and that, and I've shared your new paper widely, as, lo- as well as all the other papers out on vitamin D status versus uh, COVID impacts, which are quite fascinating. So I think today you wanted to maybe share your paper, which would be great. I don't know if you want to share the screen. Yes, uh, of course. Uh, I'll quickly walk you through on what I've prepared, essentially the paper. So um, before we dive deeper, essentially the paper was about UV radiation, vitamin D, and COVID-19. A little bit of background on this topic. So I am originally from marketing area, doing a lot of uh, analytics stuff. But then we figured out that there is some sort of uh, association going on between UV and uh, COVID-19. And that's how the whole project got started. So Essentially, if you want to get a little bit of a background on vitamin D, so I'm very sure that most of you know the sources of vitamin D. Essentially, there are like four sources of vitamin D for most of the humans. Number one is the skin synthesis by UVB radiation. So you get the UVB radiation from the sun, your skin gets exposed, and then your skin makes vitamin D. Then fortified food supplements in that order. Now, essentially, one of the major factors that not many people around the world, even I did not know before I looked into this project and looked into the literature in detail, that the major source of vitamin D is nothing but skin synthesis for many or majority of the people around the world. I think, Ivor, you can also agree to that statement. Yeah, I think it's uh, I, the people, the Inuits who traveled far, far north up into the snowy regions, you know, they probably had less of the skin, but they would have adapted. And they were, of course, eating all of these rich animal foods and fish and blubber. So they would have compensated. But for most normal people nowadays with with vitamin D, weak foods, you know, the sun's going to be very important in, say, northern Europe and elsewhere. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So essentially, I mean, for those uh, who do not have a background on vitamin D, I'll not go into the uh, specifics of these topic, but essentially you have cholesterol in your skin, which is actually converted into the pre-vitamin D3, which is converted into vitamin D3 under the influence of a solar UVB radiation. Specifically, when you go to measure your vitamin D status, you are not going to measure vitamin D, but rather 25 OHD. And that is the major circulating metabolite in your serum, which is actually measured. So essentially, when you hear about vitamin D deficiency, OHD levels that you're talking about. Now, as I mentioned, the the factors affecting vitamin D sources we have talked about, but then the major factor which is actually affecting the vitamin D and also its deficiency is UVB radiation. Essentially, there are two major factors which is influencing the skin synthesis of UVB radiation. Natural factors and human factors we classify. And the first major point is attitude, where you live. As Ivor, you mentioned, specifically what many people do not know is about 35 degree latitude, either in northern or southern hemisphere. For example, New York City, New Jersey, London, Qom in Iran, Lombardy, these are all situated above 35 degrees latitude. And what it means is sun's rays are inclined 
at these places, especially during winter time. So during winter, for example, in New York City, very limited vitamin D can be produced for about four months during winter. And that is really critical because with respect to COVID-19, we have seen that the major clusters or the major outbreak has happened towards the end of winter and the vitamin D levels were extremely low. Time of the day also very, very critical, meaning that if it is early in the morning or late in the evening, you're not going to produce as much as you will produce between 11 a.m. and 15, for example. And also weather. Weather is also another critical factor. If you remember, Ivor, uh, we had quite a lot of uh, problems in Europe during February. I could barely see sun during February because we had like a plenty of storm systems, I think, two or three storm systems. I'm not saying that that is essentially causing it, but basically that is actually even further limiting the vitamin D levels in, the sub, uh, in, in this area. So these are the natural factors which are affecting the vitamin D status especially with respect to the skin synthesis. But when you talk about the human factors, it's very important that age is a critical factor in vitamin D synthesis because when you are older, then you have limited cholesterol in your body. So you cannot produce enough vitamin D as when you are younger. And also when you are old, for example, in care homes, you have decreased exposure. You have less active lifestyle outside. Skin pigmentation essentially is very, very critical for skin synthesis. This means that uh, if you have a lot of skin pigmentation, this means that you have melanin in your skin. And melanin absorbs UVB radiation and results in a very, very less vitamin D synthesis. This means that if you compare you know, a white person against me, myself, Brown, from India. So a white person, he can go out in the sun for 10 minutes, uh, let's say now in noontime, and essentially produce 5,000 to 10,000 IUs is in a bathing suit. But essentially me, myself, I have to spend around one to two hours to produce exactly the same vitamin D. And this was very, very crucial because uh, if you look at what is happening around COVID-19, around black people and also Somalians dying in Sweden, not saying that this is the causal factor, but, um, but this could also contribute to their increased mortality. Yeah, and I think that's been seen in London and all over the world and the US as well, that the ethnic minorities with darker skin, yeah. there's huge increase rates, three to four times worse. And I'm glad you mentioned Somalis in uh, Sweden because Sweden is very topical. And not only do they have 75% of their victims are in a care home scenario, which is 50% in actual care homes and 25% with home care visitors. But the remainder who are not aged, uh, they're hugely disproportionately biased towards Somalis in Stockholm. So many people may not realize that maybe 80, 90% of Swedish deaths are either care home related or uh, minor ethnic minority related. And that kind of puts context on things, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And I can also share my personal perspective, Ivo. I've uh, been in Germany since, I've been living in Germany since 2015. So it's been like uh, four or five years now. Um, now, essentially, every winter I used to get flu, more or less twice. And I was not really aware of the vitamin D stuff until lately, you know, when the COVID came out and then also we tried to analyze it and try to talk to many experts. And then I was really surprised to find this because I had very limited energy during winter and I used to have flu almost every season. So this is sort of like um, an eye opening for me. Um, and, um, and I can clearly ascertain that there is not much of awareness behind this topic. Yeah, there's an astonishing lack of awareness. And just for simple facts, and I might share the slide later in the, the edited video, but in 1988 to 92 in America, they did a survey and white people were around 50% above 30 nanograms, the blood measure, which is not great, but it's kind of okay. But then around 12 years later, they did the survey again and it had dropped to around 25% above 30 nanogram. But for the black people, it was incredible. They were only at 12% of them above 30 nanogram. And then 12 years later, they were down to around 3% only above uh, 30 nanogram. So if you take an evolution, 
evolutionary uh, Indian or African person or the Maasai, and they're generally going to be in the 40s. Nowadays, our populations of these people are literally down at a, a level of 15 or so or 20 on average, which is deficient. Yeah, it's terrible. Terrible, yeah. Absolutely. And then lifestyle and mobility, I think uh, you can agree to that as well. If you are going less outside, uh, wearing the protective clothing, um, for example, Muslim women wearing the headscarf and all, and limited mobility, I mean, they are also sort of like prone to uh, deficiency because they have a reduced skin synthesis. And here is also one, um, uh, one topic. Uh, uh, so if you look at um, Ecuador, what I have seen is like, uh, uh, I've searched Ecuador why the mortality rate is higher despite being in the equator. Some studies shows that they are using more sunscreen. Uh, so sunscreen also effectively reduces the vitamin D synthesis by um, a huge amount. I'm not saying that you should not use for a sunscreen. You should use sunscreen because uh, uh, essentially if you have a type 1, type 2 skin, you are prone to sunburn, so you have to protect yourself. But it has to be also in balance with the solar exposure. Yeah, and I've heard culturally in some of these countries that they want to have fairer skin, they desire that, and apparently quite widespread resistance to darkening the skin. Uh, which for dark skinned people is very dangerous because you're you're creating a non evolutionary kind of dangerous situation without knowing it absolutely absolutely and uh, these are the factors i think and also you, you can see that city centers very much less light uh, solar light actually penetrates for example slums in india is one example um, there are also reports coming out that uh, in slums is spreading of course one major factor is also incidence which is the r naught so R0 is higher because of the physical proximity, but another reason could be also like I mean D. Yeah, and and malnutrition is thrown in there as well. Absolutely. So there's yeah, quite a few more factors. Another interesting point someone brought up on my YouTube comments, and I didn't know this. It was an older American guy, and he said he remembers when the Vietnam War was on, that people dodged the draft and dodged the war, and going to Sweden was one popular way. But they actually had a surge in rickets in Sweden, where the black Americans, after a few years when they stayed in Sweden, they actually had rickets uh, challenges and they had to address it. So for people who don't know, the, the malformation of bones in younger people, rickets, it's profound vitamin D deficiency, like down at a level of a couple of nanograms. And um, and that's what can happen uh, in, you know, ethnic or ethnic minorities in somewhere like Sweden or Northern Europe. You can even go all the way to to rickets and rickets is coming up in England the last 10 years. Lots of articles where rickets is popping up around the place, which would be seen as an industrial revolution disease long gone. It's coming back now. Things are that bad. <laughs> things are uh, that bad yeah i mean essentially what i think about it is like uh, it could be that uh, covid-19 is essentially two pandemics converging one is actually the covid-19 and the second is the vitamin d it sort of crisscrossed and then could be well it would be very synergistic yeah because i would guess looking at the data from the multiple human studies where being above 30 nanogram you have 10 times less risk of severe impacts or death then if you had a population that were all naturally at around 40 nanogram with good nutrition and none of the problems we're talking about i guess it's probable you would not really even notice the epidemic in that scenario it's possible so it's possible, yeah, it's possible. Uh, but um, we also need to be careful about uh, the causality and association. Um, perhaps this 25 OHD or vitamin D could also be a marker, uh, marker for something else, and which is very important and critical to notice. I think you also agree to that, huh? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I always stress that point. So it's well taken, Rahul, that, yeah, it is a marker for inflammatory disease. So if you have insulin resistance or inflammatory chronic disease, it can drive down your D. So I guess in, in my theoretical example, where we had everyone above 40, it wasn't just because they got sun and just because they got D-rich food. It's a theoretical example where everyone is up at 40 because they are really healthy and they have no disease and therefore they are not, their immune systems are in 
in great condition and then this virus does not matter so much yeah. absolutely absolutely now think about this scenario uh, we have talked about vitamin d the major source of sunlight now the sunlight and the uvb radiation it varies according to seasons and this means that let's let's take a graph i mean this is from again holic 1998 So this shows the pre-vitamin D3 formation percentage of pre-vitamin D3 formation from the cholesterol. Now above you will see the northern hemisphere um, um, cities. Below is the southern hemisphere cities, and you can clearly see that it is going up during the summer months in the um, um, northern hemisphere countries, whereas in the southern hemisphere cities it is going down. Now what is essentially very important is if you if if the hypothesis related to vitamin d is uh, essentially correct then this means that in the summer months here in uh, northern hemisphere things are going to be better this means that uh, less infection less number of tests and so on and so forth if the theory is correct southern hemisphere countries for example argentina brazil johannesburg um uh, cape town these are the cities in uh, um, south africa it's going to be um likely to be more and more and this is this would be one of the primary evidence that uh, um there is seasonality in covid-19 and uh, the southern hemisphere countries need to be prepared if this theory is correct yeah and i think it's very fair it is associational of course but still it's something people should all be thinking and talking about because there's so much talk about this and so little about the science it's all about lockdown and and you know distancing whereas it really should be about the science of robustness now interestingly you haven't got there rahul but australia and new zealand are cases of countries that have come out of a long hot summer with an absolute massive absolutely yeah. absolutely and if you look at the australian and new zealand cases it's uh, it's it's quite um, uh, it's quite remarkable that most of the cases uh, covid cases reported in australia are abroad acquired this means that it's not acquired locally it came from let's say european or um, north american countries and that is remarkable in my opinion sort of it, like uh, yeah please go ahead oh yeah it is it's kind of a smoking gun uh, one of many to think about uh, the other thing is people say well you know they were early in the uh, issue and they locked down quickly but interestingly my australian friends tell me they didn't really have a very strong lockdown at all and yet they still have almost no severity like you say it's also people who came in mainly uh, but the other thing is that they were spiked almost certainly because they had i don't know 100 flights a day coming from china through november december and into january like so there's no question but they had ample exposure but nothing really took off or happened right Yeah, absolutely. I was really closely monitoring Australia and New Zealand because they were the countries for us to to check whether our hypothesis is correct or not. And if you look at Brazil now, now Brazil is spiking. Now if you look at the UV index of Sao Paulo, it's actually going down. It's uh, similar to here. Not saying that is the reason, but uh, there is something going on there. it should be well this should certainly be one of the key factors of multiple i know brazil was known as well for having a huge diabetes issue and you know soft drink consumption and metabolic disease insulin resistance then you've got the cities dense like you say and and smog and you've got uh, malnutrition as well or or less than optimal nutrition so there are a lot of factors but i i feel rahul if we had a model where we included all of these factors properly um i bet that model would have great predictive power if we included seven or eight or nine key factors but there again the interesting thing for the listener is that these seven or eight key factors are mostly not being discussed worldwide in the context of this challenge it's mostly around lockdown and then we can ease lockdown and we'll be okay but we got to worry about a second wave and maybe we'll get a drug or a vaccine but you notice in my summary there none of the six or seven key factors are being thought about or addressed which is kind of insane absolutely absolutely this is uh, this is what i am also missing in this uh, 
in this whole pandemic scenario, you know, we are not talking about the factors. We know that there are certain comorbidities which is actually affecting um, or driving up the death rate. We know that. But what is causing it? What is the likely factor? What is the underlying mechanism? We are not talking about it. We are talking about, as you said, lockdown, easing the lockdown, R0. R0 is a great measure. I, I like it a lot because it gives uh, an understanding of how fast it is spreading. But if imagine, you know, this will spread to 70% of the world population, then R0 is not the key factor here. The key factor is what can we do if it spread? Yeah, what can we do to impact uh, severity and to greatly reduce severity? That's the biggest game in town, but it's the game no one's talking about. And I guess... One reason is there's really no profit or business model in any of the factors that you improve to sort out this issue. There's just nothing. So no one is driven. No one is motivated. No one, no one cares almost. So for all the virtue signaling and, you know, the politicians caring and saving lives, supposedly, at the end of the day, they're, they're not really caring about the science. They're not really caring about actually saving lives. Uh, which is ironic and it's quite frustrating for me in the last couple of months, but that's the way the world runs these days, it appears. So sorry, I'll let you get back to the, uh, the slides there. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, now, now, the thing is, I'm, I'm going to show you this graph. This graph is uh, also taken it from, uh, from uh, one, of the, uh, one of the paper, The Role of Season. Uh, might be interesting. This is basically mapping out uh, epidemic outbreaks uh, um, according to season. So here you can clearly see uh, countries above 30 degree north latitude. It has a high seasonal prevalence and then in summer it goes away and then winter it comes back again. It's reversed in uh, southern countries below 30. Now what is essentially very important to note is uh, the countries between uh, um, uh, between these tropical zones. And this is the key factor because l most of the world's population live here. Uh, and this includes Brazil as well. Now, this doesn't seem to follow any seasonal pattern, um, which is also mentioned here. But essentially, when I looked at uh, uh, certain countries, uh, I could clearly see that uh, the um, influenza A, for example, which is mentioned here, it peaks uh, in monsoon time, for example, in India. So um, that get lost here because the monsoon is a, a different part of the countries which is located. Now, essentially, if you think about it, then we are actually approaching monsoon in India, June, July, August. Um, and if this hypothesis is correct, a lot of people are going to be vitamin D deficient during monsoon. And that's a lot of people that we are talking about. So essentially, um, we are reaching a point where in... Uh, it might get out of control if this uh, theory is correct, which is my biggest worry. It might. Yeah. That, that is, Rahul, a, a huge concern. And, and I had an idea of this data, but I hadn't seen this actual chart that I recall. And this is perfect for all the people who are asking me, but what about Brazil? But what about this? But what about that? And I keep trying to explain Northern Hemisphere, it's winter season for these problems. Southern Hemisphere, where, who are the opposite, it's, um, well, it's their winter season, which is more like uh, June, July, August. And then when you're near the tropics, it's a different dynamic because you don't have UV going up and down so much. There's other factors like cloud cover, monsoons, and maybe other factors as well, like nutrition and all those things we talked about. But you're going to see a much, much less seasonal uh, effect and this graph shows it beautifully this should really help people who are trying to work through this paradox in their mind you know uh, and i i agree with you totally rahul it really is a concern that these arenas or these areas with huge populations are heading into their kind of flu type season could be greatly impacted and and no one is talking about this and and preparing to save lives uh, that's done as well, Ivor, uh, in the sense that if, if let's say that because we are still here, uh, May, if this hypothesis is correct, this vitamin D hypothesis is correct, the causation is going to take a little bit time to prove, and you know that clinical trials um, and uh, 
um, the results, it's, it's going to take a while and the results are going to be ambiguous depending on how you design the study. So there will be some results which says that yes, it has an effect, some no, and then there will be a debate and so on and so forth. But if we have to save lives, uh, I think um, um, right now is the time before it uh, goes into these uh, tropical zones. As you mentioned, nutritional problems and then also other viral infections going around at the same time as COVID-19. So a lot of concern between for these countries in the tropical area. Yeah, for sure. And, and that's a key point. And you know, not to go, and again, we don't want to overstep from association into causality, but there is, there's a century of science behind this where they've acknowledged these patterns and they never really fail for, for these types of diseases. And in fairness, we are seeing already, it's associational, but it fits with all the science, that the Southern Hemisphere coming out of their summer, Australia and New Zealand, have an amazing lack of impact. And the Northern Hemisphere have had a huge impact and it's falling like a stone, right, as we come into the summer, just like all the viruses before it. So we've got all that, but we also then could say, well, what would help with these equi more equatorial reason regions? Now, supplementation may help, but we, we both, I think, agree that simply getting it from supplements may not be the same as from the UV with all the other photochemicals. So I guess the best thing people could do in those regions is in the next month or two and beyond, make sure they get as much full body sun exposure as is possible to simulate the low flu season in their bodies. I mean, that would be one thing besides better nutrition, et cetera. What, what do you think? Absolutely, Ivor. I mean, uh, um, because uh, the countries in uh, this uh, region, uh, they are not really quite aware of the benefit of the sunlight per se. Because in Northern Hemisphere, because when I came to Germany, I got to hear the word that, can we go out and get some sun? You never say that in India, because in India, you know, you shy away from sun so to speak, because sun is uh, considered as pretty, pretty heavy on you. So the culture is also kind of like sun avoidance rather than sun seeking, which is what you see in here. That's a huge factor. I'll just dwell on that for a moment. And I've tried to explain this to people after hearing it from you, um, that in the northern or southern hemisphere, like Australia, New Zealand or, or Europe, USA, when we come to the summer and it gets warm, we love it. And everyone gets out in the sun, takes off their shirts, you know, or shorts, and they get the sun and they love it. And that's one of the reasons, one of the reasons that that season may be very low in influenza, as well as the UV may be being challenging for the virus itself on surfaces and, and such like. So that's another one. But in these countries, what you're saying is, it's completely different because it's already hot all the time and the sun on your skin just adds to the discomfort. So, and darkening your skin is not culturally desirable. So every single influence is the opposite. People instinctively avoid too much direct sunlight. The opposite of the Europeans and North Americans and Australians. Absolutely. I agree to that statement actually, because uh, th that that's how it is. So, so essentially, uh, to wrap it up, so right now, some of the countries will go into monsoon. And uh, if we see a big peak in these countries, then it's pretty much certain that um, it gives more credibility to our vitamin D hypothesis. It's one way to check um, how it is going to happen. And I think in, in, in Brazil, anyways, it's getting uh, higher and higher now, probably because of the low UV index. India, we would have to watch out uh, June, July, August. Yeah, it's a great point. And it's very sad. I mean, these are hypotheses. But again, I just stress that they have a long history of research and logic. They're not just jumping on a correlation or anything like it. And hopefully people with this discussion can appreciate the cultural differences and the patterns and get a better feel for vitamin D and UV flux as part of the equation, uh, not the whole equation, because sometimes people do a straw man argument and say, oh, well, how can it be all vitamin D if X, Y, Z? It never was all vitamin D. It's just this is an important vector. Yeah. What is very, very crucial is, uh, Ivor, 
I would be extremely disappointed if it comes that vitamin D is the crucial factor and uh, people could have just gone out to get the sun in these countries. It's just as simple as that is. There's no intervention needed. It's just ask people to get some sun exposure, sensible sun exposure, not to overburn. And that's the solution for COVID. And if that becomes apparent in clinical trials and all, we would at some point in time, maybe a year afterwards, we will say that, oh, the solution was so simple, yet we failed to save the lives. Yeah, and huge quantities of lives also. And and the other thing is, I suppose, for me as an engineer, and pr probably you'd agree, the no-brainer intervention now, given what we do know, uh, even though it, there's theory, there's association, there's also mechanistic science, but given what we know, it would, if this was an engineering challenge, be a no-brainer, as the Americans say, that you would take a population in these regions, you would do the as much sun exposure as possible, and they're not going to have cancer issues or, or burning because they're already dark-skinned, so as much as possible. You would then say, well, we got to get your insulin resistance down because that's independently a risk. So we'd want you lower carb, go easy on all the rice and the chapatis and all, eat more meat, fish and eggs, real foods. That's going to help. Uh, and then maybe just general fitness and, and exercise, maybe. But, but to be honest, the vitamin D, the sun, the UV and the nutrient dense diets to lower everyone's diabetic physiology, that cluster of things being done might save just countless lives. Absolutely, because that's what we can do right now, huh? because we don't know what will cure this, but all you can do is get your immunity up and running. If you're lower in immunity, you have to absolutely boost it by whatever means you can. If it is vitamin D deficiency, take the vitamin D supplements. If you have other nutrient deficiency, take the supplement or get some sunlight exposure or pump up your immunity. That's all what we can do. I mean, at least my opinion, it's very simple logic. Yeah. And it is completely logical, though, there'll always be screechers pushing back against it, saying, oh, supplements are not the solution. You cannot boost your immune system. But we know from the science you can, whatever about supplements. And the other ones may be an honorary mention as well. Selenium uh, deficiency has been very strongly linked to uh, poor outcomes in China and in other studies. So magnesium deficiency is a huge problem, and that's a, just a given. So you've got this cluster of vitamins, minerals, and uh, resolving diabetic physiology and leptin resistance. Put them together, you're, you're just going to create a population that's way better off, and that means way less death, pretty much. Absolutely, and uh, there is, I mean, since you mentioned selenium and magnesium, uh, the thing about vitamin D is I've been researching about this um, for, for about six months now. The thing about vitamin D is it's not only... Um, vitamin, but also a pre-hormone. And this is very critical because it is essential for each and every cell functioning. So the deficient makes uh, each and every cell function less, um, uh, less good. Um, this also means that uh, um, it is involved in some other activities such as uh, absorption of calcium, which everybody knows, but also other absorption of uh, minerals such as magnesium, for example. So vitamin D deficiency has many other associated deficiencies. One is calcium, magnesium, there are some associations ongoing. So it could be well that uh, there is more associated deficiency, which we do not know yet. Yeah, no, good point. And I remember A, D, K and the fat soluble vitamins Get them all together, be sufficient, because they all interact synergistically. And magnesium, as you say, interact synergistically. You don't want to be low on magnesium. You don't want to be low on vitamin D for whatever reason. You certainly don't want to be low on both, like most people are. That's a catastrophe, um, but so easy to address. So I'd say, uh, I know we wanted to keep this one tight, Rahul. Any other key points? Because I think we talked all through the study and also covered the other aspects of D and health. But what, what do you think? Uh, absolutely. I have uh, one more aspect. I think I will just Super. quickly quickly um, so what we did is we had an observational study and the model was log linear regression model that is too much for somebody outside the statistics to know but essentially what it means is we are controlling for as much as possible for different confounding factors so for example we have uh, uh, control for 
country specific factors um, like age structure skin pigmentation and so on and so forth time trends for example counter measures by government and so on and so forth time varying factors for example cloud in index ozone so on and so forth now what we essentially find after doing all the controlling as much as possible at a country level is one unit increase in uvi and this is very significant is associated with 1.2 percentage points decline in the daily growth rate of a covid-19 deaths and also one percentage points in uh, uh, daily growth rate of a CFR decline. And this translates into a significant percentage in terms of uh, uh, percentage terms. So this essentially means that uh, what we find is, I mean, this is, a, this is far too much actually, in my opinion. I mean, I didn't expect this result. There is a far significant uh, negative association between UV index and reduction. Um, and this also shows that the protective role of UVB radiation and uh, seasonality. But one factor which is very key to understand is we are finding an association between UV index and reduction in COVID-19 deaths. This doesn't mean that it is only through vitamin D. It could also be through other mediation, for example, nitric oxide, which we couldn't actually control for. But there is essentially a, an association between UV index. This was significant. Now, what it means is essentially two different graphs. So you see that one graph is uh, um, if all the countries have uh, 6.8 UVI, which is the baseline scenario, which is the average UVI across different countries, which is the graph above. And then what would happen if, with respect to baseline scenario, if the UV increases from 6.8 to 7.8. And that is like uh, quite a lot of reduction in death, which is basically 989 or 14.22 percentage in reduction in 14 days. So essentially, this means that this will help uh, to somehow flatten the curve, so to speak. And uh, we are not saying that this is causal, because that's not something that we can claim. But if you look at what is happening in Northern Europe, um, the lockdown is getting relaxed now in various countries but the deaths uh, or the death rate is also getting flattened. Yeah, and we're and they're fantastic results. Uh, again, with the caveat, it's associational, but I love the way that you corrected for all those other factors, uh, because if you don't correct for those, you're going to lose the signal, any signal that is there. And they are substantial effect sizes, uh, highly statistically significant, uh, which if this was important, you'd expect to see significant uh, impacts once you've corrected for the other factors as you have done with the team so yeah so this is very interesting and uh, europe yeah we've got amazing stuff happening and i'm not sure people realize as uh, slovenia and czech republic in mid-april uh, one of them had a constitutional challenge and they had to stop the lockdown uh, because it was unconstitutional but basically those two countries their curve coming down in death as their summer comes in, when they dropped the lockdown, a lot of the measures, the curve didn't shift in the slightest. It kept coming down. And Israel, Israel is amazing because Israel had the tightest lockdown in the world. And two or three weeks ago, the prime minister stopped it. Basically, he said kids can go and visit their grandparents again. I mean, all businesses back. Huge change. And their curve has not changed at all and it's a couple of weeks later so the lockdown didn't have any effect and in fact uh, rahul i don't know if you saw my twitter today they had five thousand people in a pounding concert on the beach in israel yesterday and the police allowed it and they're all jumping dancing and top on top of each other so the leadership in israel now you know they really seem to have completely switched away from the lockdown type stuff and more towards maybe some track and trace and maybe they know a little of what we're talking about <laughs> maybe maybe they know i mean what is important is i mean uh, i always say that lockdown uh, may be effective in uh, reducing the incidence rate of uh, of the virus i mean we cannot say that for sure but what essentially would help is um, uh, if people are allowed to go out and get some sun uh, it will also help them to improve their mood and so on and so forth while keeping the social distancing rules, you know, while keeping two meter, three meter yeah. distance from uh, others. And that would have uh, helped uh, to boost the immunity much, much better. 
rather than complete lockdown. At least yeah, that's my think, opinion. Yeah, no, absolutely agreed. I think this is a, a zero cost, uh, healthy on every facet and every front intervention that anyone can do. And I always go out of my way for years now. I work in my uh, from home. And any days it's sunny, which isn't too often in Ireland, I go out and I prioritize middle of the day to get a big dose of sun because I know that's super healthy and I don't want to miss it. And I feel sorry for all the office workers who just don't get the opportunity. They're living in a glass cage and no UVB can come in for nitric or well, or for vitamin D through the glass in, in an office. So, yeah, we'll we'll have to see what happens and hopefully someone influential somewhere or people will share this and uh, will begin to wise up and begin to take account of the science it's not a proof but begin to think this way and think scientifically and start looking at ways we can save lives that are science-based and positive uh, in nature absolutely absolutely or i mean uh, i also hope the same in the coming days uh, um, anyway, so there are a lot of studies right now coming out, um, uh, which is showing the association between vitamin D deficiency and the severity. And all of these are association studies, not causal studies. We are still waiting for causation studies. Uh, but my hope is that uh, eventually we will find that uh, vitamin D could have helped us. Uh, uh, I hope that day is not far and we are not too late with, uh, uh, with the intervention. Yeah, I hope so too. Well, Rahul, really enjoyed this conversation. It's close to my heart and hope everyone else did too. And uh, we might check back in a while down the road and, and see if the world has wised up a little at least on this. Absolutely, Ivor. And it was a great pleasure talking about this topic. Thanks so much, Rahul. Till next time. Yeah, next time. And just to the listeners, again, to remind you that this free podcast with people from all around the world, great guests, to help support us, if you could go to extratimemovie.com, extratimemovie.com, and look at our new movie about heart disease and share that. And it actually will mention vitamin D as well. And it will show how we follow a hero with a high calcium score, high disease, over a year and he takes all the steps that we touched on to stop his disease progression and uh, let's just say we got a result at the end of the year so i hope you enjoy that and help share it thanks for tuning in guys if you're watching on youtube you can see my subscribe button in the middle of the screen and go to extratimemovie.com to see our fascinating new documentary on stopping and reversing heart disease